I guess I wanted to ask and for you to share with um, Titans members here today how our players and coaches have responded to the opening start of the season. Yeah, so you're going through it, like we, you guys have more than anyone have been part of the journey and we were, what we're trying to go and what, we, what we're doing and embedding a DNA in the organisation that's based on fundamentals, hard work and expectation and standards that actually did deliver success. Back to what Dennis was saying before, when you win that grand final for the first time, the, the level of civic pride that it drives through your community is beyond belief. We took that trophy to Mackay, we couldn't drive to the park where we were doing a simple function on because people wouldn't get off the road. It took us two hours to get from the airport down there. And, and Mackay was doing it tough at the time. The mining sector cooled off and people were you know, doing it tough, but it brings an enormous hope. The Gold Coast has never won a grand final in a team-based sport, as you guys know. Basketball, rugby union, AFL. When, you, when we bring that, when we bring that trophy home to that region for the first time, the place will go insane. And so too will our supporters who are up and down the Britain hey state. And place. welcome back to another episode here of the Gold Coast Titans Frontline Podcast. A podcast that we do our best to talk as positively as possible. Yes, I know, we are still very much struggling so far throughout the season. And we are coming in off another loss. We haven't won a game yet. But we're going to do our best today to talk as realistically as possible about what we're going through. That's what we do every single week here. We go through everything Gold Coast Titans related. We go through Tweed Ed Seagulls and the Ipswich Jets, who are our feeder clubs in the Host Plus Cup. We talk about our women's, who aren't obviously on right now. They're on a little bit later on. But we're going to be getting exciting very, very soon. Not too long now until the women start, start getting rocking and rolling. And obviously everything in between on the Gold Coast Titans front. That is what we are here for. As we've said before, well, as you guys have been commenting, this is a weekly therapy session. This is a weekly therapy session at this point, and we're happy to roll you through it, man. But my name is obviously Blaze from BKR Sport, and this is uh, also alongside me, Dane from Clarkie's Rubber League Column. Mate, how are we doing down there in Canberra? We're coming to visit you this week. Yeah, mate, it's um, obviously we'd love to be starting our season a little bit better than 0-4, but I always look forward to the Canberra trip whenever the NRL draw comes out. It's one of the first things I check, is my team playing where I live at the moment? They are, and we haven't got the results the last few years that you've made the trip down, but it's still been a good weekend. Like, we've still made an event of it. We've caught up with other Titans uh, fans and members, and, you know, we've, we've enjoyed it beyond the football results and still got to catch up with our team, so... No I think complaint. that's um, that's something that I'll re really reiterate here is that people don't actually understand as well. Like when we, when we obviously attend the games, like yes, we are there for the footy. Yes, obviously we're there for in Townsville for the footy and New Zealand and Canberra and everywhere. We're always there for that. But we also do have you know the friends that we know who are in that area who are Titans fans. You know we didn't know them beforehand. But now we know them through the footy, right? And we go for dinner. We'll, you know, go out and experience some other stuff while we're there. And at the end of the day, man, you've got to, you know, we really come together as a community. And, and that's why we do what we do here on this podcast because, you know, we do get, I get a lot of people, I don't know about you, um, Dane, but obviously I get a lot of people uh, coming up to me at games saying, oh, it's great to hear you guys on the podcast. And then that obviously leans into a conversation. And yeah, we're always uh, welcome to having a chat with you guys and, and uh, helping you through it because this uh, helps us through it, to be completely honest with you this this helps us but at the end of the day man yeah no it's always good to to see the people uh, that also support our club regardless if they're from the gold coast or wherever they may be yeah, i was surprised in red wanted how many people came up to us and actually said they're enjoying the podcast it was an awesome feeling and i got the sense people would kind of drop off over the off season but a lot of people still stuck it out man and said we're missing the footy we want to hear what you have to say about titans and yeah we had some fun creative episodes where we mucked around and did trivias and all sorts but uh, it was a great uh, it was great to get so many compliments and it really warms our heart here. So before we start, guys, a few housekeeping rules. Well, they're not rules. You don't have to follow them, but we appreciate <laughs> if you do. <laughs> uh, like, follow, subscribe, do all the good stuff that helps this community grow, if you don't mind. Um, it helps this community grow, as I said, and it's just uh, it's awesome. It makes us smile and it helps us sleep at night. So <laughs> do it, please. Also, new segment. I am just adding new segments every single episode at this point. You are missing segment at this point, man. Every single week, there's a new <laughs> segment here, there, and everywhere. When it was just me by myself when you're in Vegas, I was just, you know, running through uh, three losses, and just, there we go, we're done. But when you're here, mate, we've got segment here, segment there, segment everywhere. Mate, we've got... Uh... No, I was going to make a joke, but I won't, because that's negative. I was going to... I'm not going to say it. Uh, anyway, <laughs> this new segment, guys, phone... The front line. I tried to say that in like an awesome voice. Probably didn't come across as much. It's coming from next round onwards. Now, 
I can already hear everyone through the screen at once. Clarky, what's find the front line? Let me tell you all. <laughs> Head to www.speakpipe.com forward slash frontline podcast. Now, this would be on the Gold Coast Titans fan club Facebook group and the Gold Coast Titans frontline podcast Facebook group if you can't remember that. But it's we'll speakpipe as well. In the description of this video, speakpipe.com forward slash frontline podcast. You don't need an account. Enter your name, tap record, speak into your phone speaker or your laptop speaker, press end, press send. We'll hear it. We might even play it live on this podcast, so please keep it G. Otherwise, it'll be a lot of editing out. Oh, no, um, don't you worry. We're going uh, we're, we're to hear some, some voice messages. Obviously, guys, just to, yeah, to really reiterate there, like these, these voice messages are, you can send in questions, you can send in your thoughts, you can send in, you know, love for players and love for, you know, what we do or, you know, what the, the Gold Coast Titans are to you and whatnot. Like, there's no limit to what you say. Obviously, I know that when you put stuff out there like this, you're probably going to get a couple of people who do take advantage of it. Uh, but at the end of the day, we definitely want to obviously uh, display your support for this club through this podcast as well. So by doing that, you can call up, you can leave that voice message and uh, you know we'll listen to it here on the pod. Yeah, absolutely. And get involved. That's been our message from day one. Get involved in the comments. Now this is an even better way to get involved. You can hear yourself on the podcast for the week. Hear our reaction to your thoughts. Take question. Whatever it might be, just keep it appropriate. <laughs> Let's move into our Titans news segment. No update to our casualty ward, guys. Phil Sammy is still due back from that ankle injury in round nine. Keenan Palacia is due back from his quad injury in round eight. We had two charges coming out of last round. It was a grade one dangerous contact charge for both David Fafita and Moeki Fotuaka. Both will only be fined. No suspension there. Big news here. Join the Titans Legion. For just $97, you can receive two game tickets, a merchandise pack, and an exclusive invite to meet the team at a pre-match function in Canberra. And it's also available for the New Zealand game if you're listening and you're New Zealand-based. Instead of a pre-match function, it'll be captain's run. So there's that as well. So for more information, email membersinfo at titans.com.au or call 07 5656 5656. 5656 to speak to a team member from our membership team. Now, this is not an ad from the club. It's not endorsed by the club. We're just two passionate Titans fans that think that's a great offer and want to see our community continue to grow, uh, and, grow and thrive. Yeah, I'll also sound that as well. Is that I'm pretty certain there will be a function in New Zealand, uh, in Auckland, when I was speaking to membership. Sure. So uh, that I could be wrong. I'm pretty certain that there is, though. because uh, And there will be one for the Sydney folk uh, later on in the year, maybe the Tigers game at Leichhardt or maybe Manly. I'm not too sure just yet. Uh, but yeah, we do. Obviously, we had a great one up in Townsville on the weekend. We had Dennis Watt and Steve Mitchell there uh, having a, a nice little chat. Uh, Mitch was also organising it as well from the uh, membership department. And uh, yeah, we had some drinks included. We had some nice little nibblies and it was good to get amongst the, the fans up there in Townsville. So yeah, I put a bit of it on the, the vlog from this week. For people who don't know, I put a vlog up every single week for the Gold Coast Titans on Big Out Sport. And I put a little bit of a snippet from what Steve was saying. And yeah, look, it's just a, a bit of reassurance there. And it's great to have Steve and, and Dennis uh, really reassure the fans about what's happening and, and where we're aiming to achieve. And it's a great uh, time for you guys to, to meet fellow Titans fans and also uh, people that are involved in our great club. So it's always something great to get involved in. Obviously, yeah, Canberra this week, New Zealand next week. Uh, not New Zealand next week, Canberra this week. Then we have a home game against Manly. And then obviously New Zealand the week after in Auckland. I will obviously be at both of those. Clark, you will be at the Canberra one. And then like I said, for the people in Sydney, you won't miss out this year. Last year we had um, an away event at Parramatta, uh, which was great. Uh, and this year, yeah, I'm not too sure yet, but maybe Tigers, maybe Manly, maybe Penrith, I'm not sure. At great events to meet like-minded fans who love the club as much as you love the club if you're listening to this podcast right now realistically and it shows how much it means to our club that our executive chairman and our ceo the two at the top of our organization are showing up because when you're not getting the results in the field and you start a season zero and four like we have generally fans don't go oh it's the ceo's fault they say it's the coach's fault or it's this player's fault so it shows they really care by showing up and showing their faces there we're actually one and four by the way buddy you get it right we're one and four. Uh, well, we beat the bye if you want to count the bye hey listen we're not last and the Rabbitohs have won a game so that tells you everything they know so uh, we're not last and I will sing that hallelujah to the praise uh, as much as I possibly can because we are not last we are firing 2014 season I had tickets for the season as a member on the 50 meter line great seat, uh, seats first row 
and a lot of rival fans that come buy those sort of seats as well. You know, they want to experience middle of the field, whatever it might be. And we were first for that season for a lot of it until we slowly slipped down the ladder. And I remember there was a gentleman who sat to my right and every week he'd banded with the opposition fans and he'd always say, look at the ladder. And then it was kind of a look at the ladder. And then it was a look at the ladder. We're one above you. <laughs> and then we ran out of uh, look at the ladders, yeah, unfortunately. There's a, there's a highlight package on YouTube about that season, I'm pretty certain. I think if you type in Clarkie's Rugby League, Colin, uh, you'll get a highlight package of the season that we were in first for a couple of weeks. How good? You would get a highlight package from a 17-year-old Clarkie who was born in study of religion at Trinity College. There you go. NRLW news. We have signed Ivana Lolasio. I hope I'm saying that name uh, correctly there. Now, she recently represented Australia in the under-18 World School Sevens. She's played four games for Burley Bears in the BMD Premiership, where she has one try, one try assist, 11 tackle breaks, and she's defended really well with 25 tackles for two missed, and she's averaging 104 metres gained. For me, Blaze, I don't know too much uh, about this young athlete, but I will say, like, attack was probably the weakest area of our 2023 NRLW side. We were strong everywhere, but if we could improve one area, it would be attack. We only averaged 18 points per game, which was seventh out of the 10 teams. And I reckon a signing like this is awesome, man. Like, it gives us some spark out wide in the centres. So I really like it. How do you view this signing? Yeah, so as... Uh... I, as you just read the name out there, I was like, okay, well, that name rings a bell. And if people are Australian Rugby Union fans, Noah Lolisio used to play for the Brumbies, or might even still play for the Brumbies, I'm not too sure. I haven't been really p- t- paying too much attention to Super Rugby at the moment, besides my Fijian Drua. Uh, but Noah Lolisio actually played for the Wallabies, uh, and this is actually yeah. his sister uh, that I, oh, cool. I want to find found out here, Ivana Lolisio. So, yeah, I, I don't know too much about her. Uh, I'm not too, not too sure. Uh, but, you know, welcome to the club, and I'm excited, and she He's got uh, some great blood in her with uh, with Noah playing for the Brumbies and also the Wallabies. Yeah, that's cool. I actually didn't know that was his younger sister. That's really cool. He's um, I believe he's like a fly half, isn't he? Like he he was a backup yeah, fly a half fly for us in yeah, utility. Yeah. Yeah, he's an awesome player. So that's really cool that they're related. I didn't know that at all. Final piece of NRL news. It doesn't relate to our club yet, so we will not speak on it and speculate and talk about rumours. But Josh Schuster has been told by the Manly Seagulls he's free to leave. That's been confirmed by Seagulls coach Anthony Seabold. And, of course, people online are beginning to link him to our club due to previous ties he has with Des Hasler. Because it's a rumour at this stage, guys, we don't want to speak on it. But uh, stay tuned to future episodes if it does get further into the reports and we'll speak about it at a later date if it becomes appropriate to do so. Let's go to our blast from the past segment, Blaze. This is one where we start the podcast with a bit of positivity and we remember, oh, let's, let's blast it up. Uh, So this, this week we're up against the Raiders at GIO stadium. I want to take fans back to 2021 round 16. There were 7,646 fans at GIO stadium, the same venue we play at this weekend. We come into this game with an interesting spine. We had Brimson at fullback. Our halves were Ash Taylor and Jamal Fogarty, who will be up against this weekend. And our hooker was Aaron Clark. Now, Dave Fafita cops a first half sin bin in the 22nd minute, but we defend that period really, really well. And we go into halftime 22 nil up. Now, Justin Holbrook was our coach. I know what you guys are thinking, but there was no second half fade outs in this one. We go on to win 44 to 6. I remember this game because I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. Uh, I thought it'd be like a coin flip going in. I didn't know whether we'd win. To win by such a huge margin, I was so happy. Every time we won, I remember just waving my Titans flag, proud, screaming, um, going crazy, and just watching more and more Raiders fans slowly leave the stadium. So, yeah, this is awesome for me, man. Uh, moment, uh, The best moment for me was afterwards. Dave Fafita came up and gave me a big high five, which just added to the vibes and happiness of the moment. Uh, do you remember this game specifically? Yeah, so uh, I do remember it. So I actually personally have not witnessed this win in Canberra. So I'm looking forward to my first one this week when we get our first win there. Uh, this was I, I wasn't actually there for this game, but this was actually the week after because this was around COVID, guys. So COVID actually limited us from being able to travel a lot in the 2021 mm-hmm. season and also obviously the 2020 season. Uh, but 2021, you were still seeing parts of it. And this was the year that we obviously went on to play uh, in the in the finals, uh, which we do not speak yeah. about. We do not speak about that finals game. Uh, but this this game was actually something that we really needed to, to get because... So we'd actually gone on a little bit of a losing streak beforehand and we were kind of starting to feel like our season was fading away from us. And we went to Canberra and we'd just come off that 24-56 loss to Manly. I went and Googled it just now, nrl.com just now, uh, just to see what the, the feel was like coming into it. Now, 
A couple of weeks prior, we played Roosters, and this was a game we were down like 30 to 4 or something with 20 minutes to go. Came back to, what, 30 to 30, and then obviously Roosters ended up winning that game. And then we had the, the collapse the, the following week, so we needed to bounce back. And it just seems like every time we've really, really needed a bounce back after a massive collapse, we just seem to do it. You know, we did it with the Dolphins, and then we played Manly the next week last year, and we, we beat Manly quite well. Uh, and we did it here. You know, we were up at half time, like you said, 22-0, and won 44 to 6, and it really initiated our back end of the season, uh, because although we lost to the Eels after that, we then went to beat the Dragons, whooped them, we whooped the Bulldogs, we whooped the Cowboys, we lost the Rabbitohs in the Storm, but then we obviously ended up beating the Warriors 44-0 there. So it was a really big catalyst to get us back on track, because again, going into that game, we had lost uh, four games on the trot. So it was a really, really big game for us to turn it all around, uh, and uh, yeah, obviously we won by such a significant margin, and going into the bye. We don't want to get too sidetracked, but you did mention that Warriors game. DJ Gosling, if you're listening, yes, we will be mentioning your shirt off moment when we do our blast Take from the past awesome. versus the Warriors. Uh, we awesome. want to see that shirt off again at some stage this season. Uh, my memory from this game, Blaze, was actually Dave for feeder. Now, he did get sin bin, but he had 11 hit-ups for 14 tackle breaks, mm. meaning he was averaging more than one tackle break per run. And that's just an extremely rare NRL stat. I don't even know if that's ever been done before. And if there was someone to do it, it's only Dave Fafita, in my opinion. Would you agree with that? Look, Dave Fafita is the most unbelievable player that ever did play. And I will say this right now. I will say to this day, people still don't actually understand how quality this man actually is. He is still the best second rower in the game. And yes, it may be an extremely rare and old stat, but guess what? It's not because Dave Fafita does this regularly. He's amazing. So we're just going to back in Dave Fafita every single step of the way. His tackle break ability is the best. I mean, if you were creating the perfect back rower, you'd select him for that category. Other fans might select Kikau or Olakowatu. I'll hear the debate, but I'll be back and Dave in every single day of the week, that's for sure. Titans trivia. Last week, our question to our viewers was to name all Gold Coast Titans captains in our history. Mm. The answer revealed. Scotty Prince, Luke Bailey, Preston Campbell, Greg Bird, Nate Miles, Ryan James, Kevin Proctor, Tyrone Roberts, Jamal Fogarty, Tino Fa'asur Malawi, and Kieran Foran this year. As part of that question, we said don't include stand-in captains. Our stand-in captains over the years have been Will Zillman, David Mead, Luke Douglas, Nathan Peets, Jai Arrow, and AJ Brimson. You got that wrong, by the way. Who did I forget? Mate, you forgot Jamal Idris. So was he actually officially ever the captain for a game, or was he like named the captain and kind of like the no, preseason? Mate, no, 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 no. I thought no, it was just a joke. Uh, no, I would. Okay. Just ne- I, again, like I said last week, I will never forgive him for saying I want to be captain yeah. of the Gold Coast Titans one day, and then literally within two weeks, literally from that sentence being spoken about, he left the club. <laughs> mate, it's. That's unbelievable. You made my heart drop because I went through every season, every game, and was looking at who the captains were to make sure I got that answer right. And yeah. when you said I got it wrong, I was like, oh, well, that was a giant waste of half an hour. But it wasn't. So that was actually a really tough question. If if, if someone got that, we're really impressed. Mm. Like, seriously impressed. I think the ones that people would have been caught up on would be... Uh, some, some people might have forgot Kev Proctor uh, and Tyrone yep. Roberts. Uh, I think most people would have still got Jamal for a couple of games uh, and for... Yeah. Uh, was it, what, 2020, 2021 he was captain? Yeah, he was captain for that period. Yeah, uh, and yeah, obviously people would have got Tino, and maybe they might have forgot about Kieran, because it's so obviously recent. Uh, yep. But yeah, I think that everyone, maybe Nate Miles caught people up a little bit as well, but overall, I think most people would have got the majority of them. Yeah, it, it's it, that, look, we're going to make it a bit easier this week. So our Titans trivia question for you all in the comments now as you're listening how many Titans players have played 140 or more NRL games for our club? And can you name three of them? So people that have played 140 more NRL games for us, and can you name three? Best of luck to everyone that's going to play Titans trivia this week. Let's move into our recap or review of last round. The Cowboys defeat us 35-22. to 22. Um, I'll be honest, from my perspective watching on TV, Really disappointing performance uh, outside of that 10 minutes where Chad Townsend was sin-binned. I love that moment. Um, but I'll, I've done a lot of talking so far this podcast, probably to our viewers' displeasure. So <laughs> let me hand it across to you first. How did you view this game whilst you were in attendance there at Townsville? Hot, mate. Hot. Uh, yeah. hot, uh, hot is my answer. That place, Townsville, is a place that... 
you know, we, we celebrated before the season saying, yes, we don't get a game at Seabus in those ridiculous heat conditions that we always get. But oh, don't worry about that one. If you had gone to Townsville, you would have felt the humidity. Man, even at the night when the game wasn't on, uh, the night beforehand, I was there for a couple of days, it was just ridiculous, man. The sweat was wild. And I know our boys wouldn't have been used to that, that's for sure. I'm not going to provide any excuses before anyone goes, oh, here we go, Blake's just going to give me excuses. No, I'm not providing excuses. But it was incredibly tough conditions there, man. Really, really tough. And you saw it at the end of the game where, one, obviously they're emotional because they lost. But also, two, they were wrecked, man. You know, they were absolutely wrecked. And I spoke to Jimmy after the game. I spoke to Age after the game and a few of the boys. And, you know, I, and even Tony Francis, who was not a part of the actual official 17. He was a part of the 18 and 9. The, the traveling players were doing their warm downs afterwards. Uh, you know, the humidity was so bad that, you know, him and Isaac Fasul Malawi, who was always already, also up there, were struggling in that, that humidity, man, just warming down. So, uh, yeah, that's what I'll, I'll put as a, a preface to what I'm about to say. Now, at the game, the first half was, was very disappointing. Uh, and I think that that first try for the Cowboys really set it up in a negative way for us, thinking, well, that was really easy, uh, you know, unfortunately... Yeah. Unfortunately, BK came off his line there, came inside, and it was just such an easy run over there for Zach Labor, And that kind of did set me up to be like, okay, here we go again kind of deal. Uh, and then obviously they, they did proceed to, to beat a 16-0 in that first half. And yeah, it was disappointing. But overall, I didn't actually think that it was our worst performance in that first half comparably to a lot of the other games that we've had. I don't think it was a great performance by any means, but I did see some little things that were connecting that aren't connecting on as much as we need right now, but I am starting to see the Desi influence start to begin and the, the um, things start to turn, right? So I've got to hope for that. Now, the second half was obviously much improved, and we did see, I know that obviously Chad Townsend um, getting binned was a nice little helping hand there for you know us to score those two tries. But we also scored in the 45th minute and the 57th minute as well. So we did still score two tries without that bin, and then we scored two tries with that bin. So, you know, the second half just seems like we've really... I don't know. It, it, it gave me... And this is something Sam said. Sam uh, is also traveling with me to every single game this year. Uh, and he said... At the 60th minute, or no, sorry, the 64th minute when Bowie Firma went over. Also, by the way, Tommy did and holding back Jojo Fafita. So if he didn't score that, should have been a bin um, and penalty. But obviously we did score. At the 64th minute of this game when Bowie Firma went over the line, we genuinely had that winning feeling again. There was that feeling like we may actually go on and do this. Because at the time when we scored, we did make it, I think it was a six-point game, 28-22. Now, obviously the Cowboys have gone on through Kyle Felt to score a try through the intercept from AJ Brimson. And they've obviously gone on to kick a field goal through Chad Townsend when he came back on as well, uh, which won them the game 35 to 22. But I want to take everyone back to that 64th minute when both them went over. And I want to remind everyone how you felt in that moment. Maybe things are starting to change. Maybe things are starting to click. Maybe things are starting to move in the right direction. Although it might be not there yet, we scored four tries in a fifth, uh, in a 20-minute stanza there, and it showed that we do have it. It's just not a consistent across the game yet. And I know people will go back and say, oh, listen, you know, this happens all the time. We're not an 80-minute team. And yeah, look, you're right. But with that being said, at the end of the day, what cost us this game in the end? And I'm, I'm not saying this is anybody individual's fault. But if AJ doesn't throw that intercept there, we had every possibility of coming back and winning that game. Because that obviously was the deflating moment. We, we lost the ball, Kyle Felt scores. He gets his big milestone, which is something that obviously got us uh, and, and rocked us. And then they go on to, to steal the game. Without that, I think if we don't throw that intercept there, and again, this is nothing, to, I'm not having a crack here at AJ for throwing a pass. Because without him, we're not even in the game. He had an incredible game up until that point. Without him, we're not even there. But throwing that pass, he's been moved from center to 5 8. When he's in centre, that pass is obviously... Yeah, it, look, it's, it, it was a frustrating situation. And, you know, Brimmel obviously needs to learn from that situation, which he absolutely will. Um, but, yeah, if we don't throw that intercept there, I can see us going on to win that game. I can see us going on to win that game without that intercept. So, um, frustrating. Uh, without Brimmel, we don't get back into that game. And then, obviously, that's an unfortunate one that people do look at there. But at the end of the day... I finally, as Sam said, and I agree with, 
I finally had that winning feeling again at the 64th minute. And I think if that pass wasn't thrown, the intercept wasn't made, people would have actually been talking a lot more positively about this game than we're at right now. That's a fair comment, mate. The second half was definitely a reason to smile for Titans fans, and I do agree. As that comeback was on, I was genuinely jumping around the lounge room, and I had really great vibes. Um, you know, the vibes that we were feeling during some of our wins in the past, it, it would have been a really great comeback. But I just thought in the first half, the Cowboys' intensity was at a higher level than ours, particularly in the middle. I really felt their middle forwards blew us off the park. And, you know, we probably looked short a quality middle forward. And I think that's fair to say because we do know our captain, Tino, is out for the year, and we would usually have him there. Our possession rate of 44% was pretty poor. Um, you know, you do want to keep that 50-50 in there. But, yeah, their forward pack in total, they had 400-plus more metres than us, and 100 of those come post-contact. I also thought, again, I hate to bring this up like a broken record, but our fifth tackle options were a little bit poor. I would have liked to have seen a little bit more there. But it was tough for Tanner because he's obviously the only option. So there's a lot of pressure on him when taking those kicks when Kieran Foran went off. And that's a point that no other fans are going to talk about in this game. We lost our captain and our senior spine member in the game. And it's always going to be tough from that point. You take Nathan Clear out of the Panthers, they're going to struggle. You take Harry Grant out of the Storm, they're going to struggle. You take Kalen Ponger out of the Knights, they're going to struggle, right? You're also, you've got to remember as well, is that by taking those players out, now we're too short on the bench as well. So, especially in that humidity, we're seeing guys like Jimmy Joloff, who played 70 minutes in this game, who normally yeah. averages, I think, around the 50 to 55 minute mark, if I'm not mistaken, off the top of my head. Um, I think he played 70 minutes in this game. So, with those players coming out, it did obviously put more pressure in that second half as well, tiredness wise. Uh, onto you know some of those bigger boppers and and like I said Jimmy Joliffe who we'll talk in in a little bit who's been one of our better players this year uh, you know but yeah he averages I think around the 50 to 55 minute mark and and had to do 70 in those in those conditions. No doubt that absolutely contributed to the fatigue of our forward pack and why I ultimately believe they won the middle. Um, another factor in that is you know we lost good defenders like Bo Firmo who had to move out in the centres. We reshuffled our team with Brimo coming in at five eight so. There was a lot of things that went against us in this game. And I think whilst there are certainly negatives we could sit here and talk about all day, there's positives that we should focus on as a community um, and as podcast co-hosts right now. So I'll start us with that. AJ Brimson, I thought he looked really good at the six. He got his hand on the ball more. I think he could have a future at six, if I'm absolutely honest. I really liked the majority of his touches in that game. And whilst footy fans, because it did influence the result, will remember the unfortunate intercept. Up until that point, you couldn't really criticize AJ for anything. He was absolutely on fire for us. I loved his game. Mm. Tanner Boyd got a lot of hate online after from our fans. And I actually responded to a lot of these people on Instagram. And I said, come on. Like, he, he lost his hardest partner early in this game. I didn't think Tanner had a bad game. Uh, how did you see that from the from the stadium? I thought Tanner was pretty good considering he lost four. I think that definitely in comparison to previous games, you definitely saw the right direction being taken there by Tanner. And... You know, and, and again, I, I will reiterate this for people listening, is that Tanner is a part of Dez's plan through that first five game stand so that we said that he has always maintained and the club has maintained. And although there is a disconnect between fan expectation and what the club is, the club direction right now, the fact of the matter is, is that Tanner has been given five rounds at a very minimum to prove himself. And I think that we did see in this game, in the fourth game of his season, we did see those improvements. We saw a great um, kick from him, I think, with the first kick of the game. And we would have loved to have just seen him be consistent with that. You know, to have that big spiral bomb that was really, really difficult and whatnot. You know, and that worked out really well for us. But unfortunately, it, didn't, it wasn't consistent throughout the game. But at the end of the day, you know, Tanner actually did have a better game than previous by a long way. It's just that people are so set in stone right now. And this is the issue that fans do face, is that fans, once they get something in their mind, regardless of the performances coming, they will be like, no, I'm going to look for the negatives rather than the positives. And if you watch this game from a non-bias standpoint of, you know, let's just see what Tanner can provide, you know this was not an awful game from Tanner. Was it his greatest? No, it's not, but it's still a step in the right direction to him getting his confidence back. So I appreciated the effort. Does that mean long term we're now on the back on the Tanner Boyd seven halfback wagon? Not necessarily, but at the, at the end of the day, if Tanner Boyd is getting selected, we are absolutely supporting him throughout his time as our halfback because as fans, we're here to support the team. And if Desi believes in him, 
then we believe in him as well. And he has a long way to improve himself, but at the end of the day, this was not as bad a performance as people are making out online, but people are set in stone. No, perfectly said there with what Des selects we believe in, and I'm excited to see Tanner again this week. I think he got a bit of his confidence back last week. I think we'll see him improve again against the Raiders, which we obviously need for our side. Uh, Jimmy Joloff, really can't speak highly enough of him in this game and this season. He has stepped up in Tino's absence to this point, and I thought he was our forward pack leader up there in Townsville, which I would typically expect Moeki Fodawaka to fill that role. But it seems Jimmy's doing it for us this year, which is awesome. Bowie oh, yeah. Furman. I'll, I'll say on, on Jimmy Joloff, I've been really yeah. impressed by him this year. Obviously, the first game wasn't great, but once Tino has, and this has nothing to do with like, oh, Jimmy's only doing it when Tino's out. It, we've needed this. Like, we've needed Jimmy to, to be the guy when Tino's gone out to be that, not replace, well, I, I would say replacement because obviously it just is what it is. Unfortunately, Tino was injured. We need a guy to replace Tino and Jimmy Jolliffe has come in and he has replaced Tino. We're obviously not seeing the 100, 200 metres. We're not seeing the crazy X factor, but we're seeing a very, very solid forward that will just put in an absolute shift, man. An absolute shift. And I'm sure that he'll probably get something in our three, two, ones later on. Uh, and we'll talk about his stats there. But, you know, for the minutes that he's making, he's still getting 140 metres. You know, he's still getting a whole bunch of, of post-contact metres. He's, he's getting tackle breaks as well. Um, and he's making a whole heap of tackles. He may have missed a couple here today of the, that on, the, on the weekend. And unfortunately, one of the tries was kind of Jimmy kind of rushing out of the line six again and then they still scored through that that little hole at the end of the day that is a, a, a minor negative overall compared to the progress we've seen from Jimmy Jolliffe and Irish International in 2024 yeah I've been so happy with Jimmy this year I hope he keeps it up I mentioned Bo Firma before what'd you make of his game well, Bo is starting to come back into his own, you know. Uh, yeah. I think the people were very happy to, to jump on his back. And, and look, at, at the end of the day, it wasn't, they weren't wrong, you know. And if we criticise Bowie in regards to his beginning part of the season, it was individually about the game. That didn't mean that we didn't believe in him. And we do believe in him. But Bowie Firmer is one of the better back rowers in the comp. We were actually calling him for, for him to make his origin uh, debut this season. Uh, and obviously, it's been a tough grind back into it. And, and to, he was struggling to kind of get back into motion early doors. But now, we're four games in, and we saw a dramatic improvement out of Bowie Firmer this game, this season. So... I'm already telling you, like, I can already see by the way that we're talking right now that the positives are starting to come out. Despite the score, the positives are starting to show. And in the off-season, we did a podcast where we went through our entire top 30 roster and we mentioned every single rep team they were eligible for and we thought how close they might be or if they'll play for that said rep team this year. Bo Firma is someone we both had in the could play for the Queensland Maroons category. And in this game, he was forced to transition from back row to centre and mark up on Valentine Holmes. When we talk state of origin where injuries can really mess your lineup, Bo having that versatility in his game, like a Kurt Capel to go back row. Right now, the Queensland forwards are being decimated across the comp. Exactly right. No Tino, no Tommy Gilbert, um, Lindsay Collins, and they just returned from a lingering hamstring issue. So Bo Firm was still there or thereabouts, guys. It took him a few games to get back into the match fitness side of things, coming back from an ACL. A horse, great call, yeah. So there's definitely a spot there for Bowie if he keeps this form up and his versatility will help as well. Keep it up, Bowie. We love that game. And I, w- I want to give one more shout-out to Josiah Pahulu, who just had a brilliant debut for us in tough conditions where our forward pack was struggling. He took it to the Cowboys. He had plenty of spark and energy from the bench, and I really appreciated his efforts. Every elite team in this competition, Blaze, has that spark from the bench. For the Roosters, it's been Terrell May. For the Panthers for so many years, it was Spencer Lanou. It's so important. And from what I saw from Josiah Pahulu, I think that could be his spot for us, man. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Uh, you know, I people who follow me on Instagram and, and whatnot would have seen that I took a photo with Josiah. Uh, his whole family uh, were, were there in attendance, as you know, you always see with these debuts. And I don't think that Josiah Pahulu let anybody down. I think that, yeah, he absolutely gave it a solid old crack. Uh, seven runs for 65 metres in this game uh, with 32 post-contact metres. Uh, and that was just in a 31-minute stint there. So, you know, to go up to there to uh, the Cowboys, who are 3-1 and one coming into this game against us, they were 3-1 and one coming into us. Obviously, they hadn't beaten two quality of opposition. They did lose the Broncos beforehand. But with that being said, you didn't see Josiah come into this game scared or nervous. He came in and absolutely tore up. So, uh, you know, he, he got welcomed into the fire, literally, with how hot that game was. 
And uh, yeah, I'm very happy with what we saw out of him. And it, that's why he's been selected again this week. Yeah, what I liked was he played his natural game. Like he didn't go from Q Cup to NRL and try to change too much. Mm. He still played that explosive style. His first contact was still really, really strong. Um, and sometimes you can see these young players, particularly young middle forwards like himself, come to the NRL and they just don't quite look up. Even like the great Payne Haas. I'll tell you why. And this is something mm. that the boys always say. I didn't ask Josie this, but I should have. But the boys always say this. The speed of the game is such a drastic difference, man. So you see these guys not being able to adjust to the speed on their first game. But again, I think that Josiah did adjust the speed pretty quickly here uh, and didn't look out of place. But that is the biggest uh, difference between the Host Plus Cup and the NRL is that the ruck speed and the, the ball movement and everything is just obviously at such a uh, speedy level comparatively that it catches a lot of players out. But I don't think it caught Josiah out. No, I think you could almost argue in terms of our line speed and defense and the intensity in our early hit-ups and start to sets, he actually added to what was already out there. So he didn't just adjust to the, the speed of the game at NRL level. He came on and elevated us and elevated the forwards around him to that same standard. So this is a guy I've got earmarked as a future captain of our club, potentially. That's as high as I'm viewing him. And I genuinely mean that. I've been really impressed with him so far. And I'm super excited he's here in our side again this round Before against the Raiders. Yeah, before we move on as well to our three two ones here, I do want to shout out someone who I don't believe will get a three two one, but also I have seen a bit of stick online, and this will come back to my set in stone fan thought processes, is David Fafida. You know, people have gone out and said that he wasn't that impactful. The guy had 179 run meters in this game. The guy had 179 run meters in this game from 21 runs with 73 post contact meters, had a line break, had a line break assist. Um, had two tackle breaks. Actually, to be fair, but he could be in our 3 2 ones, to be fair. Uh, but, you know, and made a whole bucket load of tackles. You know what? I'm, I'm probably going to put him in my 3 2 1. But I did have to shout him out because I saw comments saying, oh, Dave this, Dave that. He's not doing his job. He's on too much money. That's a set in stone thought process. You, uh, I will tell you right now, for everyone listening, if you think that Dave is not doing his job and is not playing quality football, then you're just saying that I expect him to score 50 tries a season, which is just so unrealistic, man, because he is a very balanced player. And honestly, there's nothing wrong with the stats that I've just read out there, and he had a fantastic game. Quick funny one before I get back to the series. Did you see Steve Blockeroach before the Bulldogs game, a similar play to Dave, uh, to Dave Fida in Viliami Kikiao? He said he's got the ability to uh, break 20 tackles and score 20 tries a game. The problem is he just doesn't do it. He said that about Dave. <laughs> No, he said that about kick out. Oh, but it reminds player. me of Dave, where they like because these X Factor back rowers have the ability to score tries and beyond Block Roach's point saying he should score twenty a game, which is just idiotic. Mate. Um, you know, we, we expect that we expect it every week and it's just not possible. If and I, I can tell you right now. Go on, go on. Well, if it, if if those stats you just read me, if I didn't know which player it was and you told me that it was Cleese Haas or Jacob Barlick or one of our younger back rowers at the club. I'd go, wow, what a great game. But because it's David Feeder, we sit there and go, oh, but he didn't score a double and he didn't break 10 tackles. Yep. So he's held to a bit of an unfair standard. Well, mate, if you ever catch me, and I just want to throw this out there, respect him for his playing days, but uh, as a commentator, if you ever catch me actually acknowledging Blocker Roach's opinion on today's game, <laughs> I, I honestly find a new co-host for this podcast because I don't deserve to be here, mate. Um, you know, again, great player on his day, but I'm, not, I'm sorry, but I... Everyone who watches my channel knows, not a fan of Local Roach. Not a fan. Because, again, as well, he does not like the Titans. And I will stand by that point all the time. I do not hear him say positive things about the Titans literally ever. So, uh, yes, I do not care for Blocker Roach's opinion in regards to rugby league. But great player on his day. Great player. Uh, let's hit, hit me with your 3 2 ones. I don't think we're going to hear Blocker Roach in there. But let me know who you had your, <laughs> for your 3 2 ones from this game. Uh, well, I'll give you my three. Uh, my three points is going to have to go to Jimmy Jolliffe. And the reason why Jimmy Jolliffe is because he's standing up. He is doing what he needs to do right now. He is coming into the place of Tino, which is a very tough position to come into, especially with how much our club and our fan base absolutely loves what um, they absolutely love what Tino did. So, you know, Jimmy Jolliffe is a guy who's coming 137 run meters with uh, had. 27 kick meters in this game. <laughs> Wait, did he have wow. kick, 27 kick meters? When was this? I don't remember it if he did. 
Well, it says 27 kickmeters on NRL.com. Uh, so well, good Jimmy. that's interesting. Uh, big Jimmy. Watch out, Tanner. Nine. Yeah, exactly <laughs> right. And now there's another kicking option on our team. Um, yeah. Oh, no, sorry. You know what? That's kick return meters. Forget me. Kick but return meters. Yeah, I thought listen, it could have been. And now I'm blocker roach. You know, just don't listen. Watch out, Jane Campbell. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. Um, but he had 57 post contact meters, two tackle breaks, uh, and made a bunch of tackles. And yes, look, missed a few tackles, but at the end of the day, Everyone missed a few tackles, uh, and he's not the highest with four. So uh, I'm willing to kind of move past that with Jimmy, especially considering that he didn't give away. Oh, he gave away that six again, but that ended up being and that was his only issue in this game. But Jimmy was definitely our best. So who's your three and also your two? Three points for me also goes to Jimmy Joloff. Now it wasn't a perfect polished performance from our prop forward, but what I loved about Jimmy was the effort was there. And when, we, when you're a struggling club like you would say we are at the moment, yet to record a win this year, the only way you get out of that hole is through effort, continuous effort for the full 80 minutes or the full time you're out there. And that's what Jimmy brought for us. So I'm more than happy to award him the three points. If everyone brought the same effort as Jimmy this week, we will win. It's that simple. You don't win footy games by being perfect. You win them by trying your hardest for the full 80 and capitalizing on opportunities which come from hard work. Three points for Jimmy. Two points for me is Bo Fermor. I was really impressed in the way he was able to seamlessly transition to center, which is very difficult for a lot of back rowers to do. We see some do it to great effect, like a Kurt Capel, CSC Fatalikai, but even someone like Dave Fafita at our club wasn't able to do it to great effect. The way Bo Fermor mid-game shifted out to the centers and didn't just hold his own, he marked up on Valentine Holmes and defended him quite well and also created line break opportunities for us, scoring a try of his own. I really love that from Bo. That versatility was awesome. He gets my two points. Who gets your two points and one point? This is actually really hard because as you're reading it out, like I, there's actually three players. So I'll, I'll just, kind of, it's crazy because we did lose this game by 13 plus, but there's actually kind of four players I want to fit into these final two. But I want, for, for the purpose of we are counting our numbers throughout the season, uh, my two points is going to go to Dave Fafita based on the stats that I read out. Uh, it's going to go to Dave. I, I, I don't think that people understand how much of an impact he actually does have. Again, I read it out. 21 runs for 179 metres with 73 post-contact metres. So just a fun fact, the most run metres on our team and the most post-contact metres on our team had a line break, also had a line break assist, had two tackle breaks from 19 hit-ups, um, had a, a 12 metre dummy half run, which was good to see, had an offload in his game, 33 tackles, and only had one missed tackle there. Um, and, and did have a kick for 11 metres, the old David from Fafita, right? So, yeah, look, there might have been a couple of errors, but at the end of the day, again, Dave Fafita, Dave Fafita is a very integral part of our team, and it's just as simple as that. So I'll give Dave Fafita my two points. Now, in regards to my one point, there is a couple of players. I'll give a couple of shout-outs after you do your, your one point. But my one point, I'm going to go to AJ Brimmer, the AJ Brimson man, big Brimdog millionaire. Uh, look, I think that he went from that centre to the 5-8. I think in the first half, uh, we could have been down by 40 if it wasn't for him in that first half. I think defensively, he was fantastic uh, and really locked them down quite well. Uh, also ran for 114 run metres uh, from 11 runs. Uh, had 33 post-contact metres, a line break, a try assist, uh, obviously for that JC one. Uh, had a tackle break in the game as well. Uh, did make 24 tackles. Did miss a few tackles, though, which is quite unfortunate. Uh, but if anyone watched the first half, they know he was fantastic there. And then the second yeah. half, obviously, transitioned to the 5-8 and obviously was a big part of the reason why we'll come back until that pass. So for me, I will definitely give that point to AJ Brimson because I do think that he did have a, uh, a solid enough game to bring us back in. But just obviously, we need to take that that um, that error in that pass out of the game. I think for AJ Brimson too, you consider we went into half time. what was it, 16-0 down? Mm -hmm. That would have been a lot worse without his defense in the centers. The amount of opportunities he shut down from Valentine Holmes was huge. Mm -hmm. And I'll stand by that. If that was any other center, we would have been in big trouble. AJ Brimson's defense uh, was really, really good for us. And he stopped a lot of tries or opportunities there. So I love that you gave him the one point. I went the way of Jaden Campbell. I just felt he added a lot to our attack. I know Brimson did transitioning to six, but I love Jaden out the back. He also recorded nine tackle breaks, which is a league high across the round. Um, so just to put that in perspective, guys, out of every player that played last round, Jaden Campbell broke the most tackles of anyone that played. Yeah. And I just really think that, you know, given where we're at and we are struggling to score points, JC breaking those tackles and creating some opportunities 
was really huge to us, uh, adding to our, our total points scored, which is something we need to continue to do. I'll let you give some shout-outs, and then we'll get to the leaderboard and what we're thinking with that. But yeah, go ahead, shout-out some players from the game. I want to put a comparison here just to, to back up what we are talking about in regards to Tanner before. Tanner, 17, so he obviously has a lot of issues from the fans in regards to his kicking game, right? So he had 17 kicks and for 542 metres in this game. And for the Cowboys, Chad Townsend with 7 kicks got 172. Scott Drinkwater with 5 kicks got 136. So that's probably relatively on par, 136 times it by 3, 300, 390 or so. But see, the thing is that Tanner is still out-totaling these guys by a country mile in that situation with the amount of kicks that he's having. If you actually compare the two and give those same amount of kicks, he is actually kicking for a long way down. It's just that we need to see it obviously more lofty so that we can get our line up and prevent them from getting out of the 10, getting out of the 20 kind of deal and smacking them straight away. So that's what we need there. But at the end of the day, he is actually kicking for quite a few metres. Now, obviously, a shout-out does need to go to Josiah Bahulu for coming in and doing what he did. I think that was great for a debutant uh, and in those conditions as well. I think that he'll tear it up in Canberra. We need a big forward pack against Canberra that we'll talk about in a second. Uh, and the other one was obviously Bowie Firma. You know, uh, Bowie Firma definitely deserved a, a shout-out for his performance, man. Uh, did I not? Did I give it? No, I didn't. I gave it to Dave Fafita instead. Uh, but yeah, I, I definitely couldn't go without saying, um, you know, shout out to, to Bowie Firma and, and also JC, who, as you said, was was absolutely unbelievable. So uh, yeah, it's, it's unfortunate that we're saying absolutely unbelievable, despite the fact that we lost. But again, it is a step in the right direction. That's it, man. It's a step in the right direction. Like if we were hosting a Panthers podcast right now and they lost by 13, we're probably not sitting here saying, oh, but he, you know, we, we kicked far or we had tackle breaks. We create opportunities. But we have to be realistic as Titans fans, right? We're not at that level yet. So we have to look for these positives until we grow as a club and get to that level where we can be more critical when we need to, for example. Uh, but for our 3-2-1s, what we're going to be doing is keeping the leaderboard this year in an Excel spreadsheet. And we're going to hand out the award at the end of the year. And maybe we'll even get a medal done up and give it to the player. At the moment, we are calling it the front line's finest. But we want to hear from you in the comments section. And that's why... Uh, we always ask to hear from you guys. We want this to be a community podcast. Would you prefer it to be like the Preston Campbell medal, named after one of our great players? Um, do you have another fun name that suits better than the Frontline's finest? You guys let us know. At the moment, it's Frontline's finest, but we're not 100% set in stone. And if you guys can come up with something better or you guys prefer it to be named after a legendary player, please, please let us know. You will definitely get a huge shout-out on the podcast. And um, you could be you know, instrumental in what we come up with when we create a final medal and give it to the player, which would be really cool as well. Absolutely. One more recap, guys, before we get into our preview for this round. It is our affiliates recap. The Tweed Seagulls defeat the Papua New Guinea Hunters 36 to 28 to get their first victory of the year. Tommy Weaver had one try assist, but he did only run the ball four times for 28 metres. He had 16 tackles for two misses. So when people are saying Weaver needs to come in, Tanner needs to go, I want to see a little bit more out of Tommy in reserve grade uh, because I do think in a 36-point victory or where we're, where we're scoring 36 points, that is, Tanner is also going to come up with at least one try assist within that. I think Tanner's going to run the ball more than four times in that. So good game by Tommy, but I know he can play a little bit better and I want to see that from Tommy in reserve grade. Jacob Arlick, um, he had 128 metres gained, which was the most of all Tweed's forwards. He also made 27 tackles, which is the second most of any Tweed player. He did miss five. But there's great activity there from Jacob, um, and he'll continue to be an option for our forwards depth. How did our Ipswich Jets go, mate? And how did our Titans go, more importantly, in that lineup? Yeah, I'd actually take a bit of a positive out of this one. So the Ipswich Jets did get uh, beaten by the Redcliffe Dolphins, uh, but it was 40 to 32, so a lot of points. Defensively, neither team uh, performed <laughs> great in this game, but attacking wise, both teams played well. And with all due respect, I don't really care about the Dolphins. I care about the Ipswich Jets. And to, for us to you know, score 32 points in this game, uh, coming into this one, uh, let me just quickly have a look. The Dolphins are in the top four uh, right now. So wow. I'm actually pretty pleased that the Ipswich Jets were able to give it a red-old crack. And if you go back to... Uh, I just kind of uh, gapped out on what I was saying. Uh, well, Jets players can hold their head high, mate. To score 32 points when you haven't won a game in two years mm -hmm. prior... And against the top four side, that's an awesome effort, man. That's really, really positive signs. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and, you know, they've already won a game this season as well, which, uh, you know, is always starting to see some good stats. So again, we're seeing the positives in motion, guys. We saw Tweed win. 
We're seeing Ipswich still stick in games against the top four opposition. Okay. I'm looking forward to it. But Kenny Mamalo, uh, he had 143 metres with 82 post contact and two tackle breaks. Uh, we had the nice. Aaron Schuppi Schuppmeister, who scored a double, kicked four from six on goals. Uh, 176 run metres, uh, 94 post contact, four tackle breaks, and z six tackles with zero miss. So really impressive performance there by the Schuppmeister. Uh, you've got Loffy, a Loffy on a camp, Pereira, who obviously uh, is down there with the Ipswich Jets. Scored a double, you expect that. 113 metres gained, four tackle breaks, and four tackles for zero missed. Uh, we also had Ryan Forum, who scored again. 103 metres gained and 16 tackles for one miss. So overall, there's not a single negative player there for Ipswich, despite the fact they lost by eight points there. At the end of the day, our boys are doing a job. Our boys are putting the shift. And despite the fact that the Jets might be in 13th position... I'm pretty impressed by that performance. And actually, that's what I was going to say. That's what I forgot to say. They were actually leading this game with about 10 minutes to go, I believe it was. Uh, so the Jets has Dolphins. So, uh, yeah, the Dolphins scored three tries in the last 20 minutes. So the last try for the Jets. So they were on 32 points at the 50-minute mark of this game. And the Dolphins scored three tries. So they had about... They scored three tries from the 62, 71, and 78 minutes. So they came back in this game. So the fact of the matter is, I think it was 32 to 22. The Jets were up, and then unfortunately they did fall apart in that last 10 or so. Uh, but at the end of the day, again, the, the team that they were playing had guys like Sean O'Sullivan in that team, who is very good yeah. there, has played for the Panthers. Trey Fuller's played. Uh, Valencia Tefare, who a lot of people may know. Um, you know, They've got uh, some really good players on their team. This is the direct, uh, straight up, you know, uh, pathway club. into the Dolphins. Yeah, exactly right. Into the NRL team. So, uh, yeah, I was impressed. I'm pretty happy with it. And I'm pretty... Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with our performance overall. Now, I was happy with Brian Kelly scoring. And I'm happy that he got his 150 NRL games. A fun fact, he scored in every single milestone game from his debut up to 150. But with Aaron Schott putting these numbers together, keep in mind he's ran over 200 metres as well in a game for the Jets. He's playing really consistent footy, mate. Um, not only in attack, he's making six tackles with zero missed. He's consistent in every area, whereas I did notice BK missed a few tackles there in the Cowboys game. So is Shoppy a live option, mate? If BK doesn't perform to his best this week, do we start to think maybe Shoppy comes in? Well, as we'll, we'll speak about in the, the Titans versus Raiders preview, you know, every player kind of right now is, is on notice, every single player, uh, and, unless we win this week against the Raiders and then people will start to get back on the we love you train. But look, BK definitely is one that I do see a lot of criticism for. Uh, I do think that uh, defensively, yeah, look, he does need to be a bit better. And I spoke about that first try that he did let in uh, to uh, Zach Lade, but uh, for the Cowboys early yep. on there. But at the end of the day, you know, I want to see these first five rounds first. So I want to see how they go this weekend. And then I will, as we said last week, this week we should probably talk about it, 1 through 17. I think next week, post that first five games, we'll go via the Desi Hasler routine, the club direction. I think next week we put a segment in where we give our best 1 through 17s that we personally believe, yours and mine separately, um, and we'll see how it goes. But yes, look, I think the Shubby is putting a, his hand up to say, yeah, look, I want to have a crack there for sure. Um, and yeah, it'll be interesting to see kind of what happens there. But at the end of the day, BK was also re-signed by Desi, so I'm pretty certain he has a lot of belief in him. But it comes down to the five-week plan that Desi had. This will be our fifth round again. This will be round six, but we had a bye. So this will be our fifth game against the Canberra Raiders. So BK's got a lot to play for, but so does everyone, man. So... Um, yeah, it'll be interesting, but I definitely think Shoppy's putting his hand up. Desi certainly has a soft spot for BK because he did sign him uh, to the Manly Seagulls back in the day from us, and then when coming to us with the Titans, BK was his first re-signing. So uh, he definitely likes BK, but I just think Shoppy's form at this stage, scoring doubles. Uh, what I love about Shoppy's game as well is he's not making these huge meters gained without post-contact meters. And what I mean by that is he's not slipping through easy gaps and running the field so it looks like he had a lot of activity when he really didn't. He's up there with, you know, 90, 80, 70 post-contact metres per game, which means he's really working hard with those hitouts coming out of our end. And when we're missing a key leader like Tino, I think we could really use that from Shopee in our NRL side. So I've got my eye on Shopee this week for the Jets, yeah, um, and I've also got my eye on BK. Yeah, no, I agree. I think that's definitely one to look for. Uh, uh, for BK's defence, though, 
Shuppy is doing this at the host plus cup level, uh, and I'm not yep. that's not me having a crack at Aaron, but uh, Aaron knows I love him. But at the end of the day, like it, it is host plus cup action, and uh, BK is at standard. NRL level, so there is that different standard. So yeah, look, I guess again, if BK has a poor game this weekend, uh, then then it definitely comes into the equation, but. You do need to, if for example, you did bring in Shuppy for BK, you have to stick with that for a good little bit to see if Shuppy works with the system. You can't just bring him in, he has a poor game against Manly next week, and then doesn't perform, and everyone's like, I'll oh, get Shuppy out. It's like, you know, people were calling for Shuppy out last year, and they got their yeah. wishes, and then now people are like, oh, well, you know, maybe, maybe Shuppy will come back in. It's like, yes, he's doing it over Host Boss Cup, but this is why we say fans are very set in stone. <laughs> but the, in yeah. situations like this, they forget about how set and stone they were in the past. No, it's fair. Um, we're all guilty of that as footy fans. Look, if I could say something to both players, like if I had both players in, in the room with me, I'd say to BK, hey, he's nipping at your heels and I know you're capable of better of what you're mm. putting together. We love what you bring to this team when you're at your best and we really want to see it, mate. And then if I could say something to Shoppy, I'd say, mate, keep it up. You know, you're showing us why you belong at NRL level and we want to see you back there. So mm. competition, it's always healthy to have at the club. We're happy uh, to have that. Jets, they are back in action in Ipswich this Sunday at 3 p.m. where they play our former affiliate club, the Burley Bears, and Tweed have a bye, which is good for me, mate. We got our first win. Let's go into a bye, keep working on it, and keep growing our season and there. I'll say on that as well, I'll go into the, the latter position of these two teams. So obviously right now, the Tweed and Seagulls, after their first win, they do go into 14th, which is above the Clydesdales. Uh, and as you said, tweet up the bias. We're going to go up another two points, uh, which will be fantastic there. Uh, and the Ipswich Jets, who are taking on the oh, the, the Burley Bears there. Um, that's going to be a big one for them. The Bears haven't been fantastic so far this season, though. They have played four. They've got the two wins and also two losses. Uh, and if we go back to last week for the Burley Bears, uh, where are they? They lost to the Capras 30-24. With that being said, the Capras are in first position with six points, four uh, games played, three wins, one loss. So, uh, But they've had 110 points for and 78 against. Uh, but for the Bears, they've got 104 points for, 77 against with a differential of 27. And the Jets have a 100 points um, against and 84 points for. So off by about 20 points in regards to the scoring. Uh, and have given up about 23 more points. So it is going to be tough for them for sure. But with that being said, we have seen improvements. They won a couple of weeks ago. They did well against the Dolphins, who are above the Burley Bears. So I definitely give them a good shout. And now Titans that are named in that Jets game at this stage is Ken Mamalo, Aaron Schott, Alofiana Khan Pereira, and Ryan Foran. The 5 8 for the Jets is currently not named on the website. So um, keep a watch there. Uh, but if you are looking for a, a game where you want to watch more Titans in action, you can watch that on Q+. Uh, before our Titans kick off three hours later. All right, let's leave all of that in the past, and now let's look forward at the point in the podcast where we preview our next game, oh, Sunday, 6.15pm. So. We're on the same times here in New South Wales, ACT and Queensland now. We are against the Canberra Raiders in Canberra. They defeated us on both occasions last year. However, you remember one of them was very, very, oh, maybe not very. Did we play them twice last year? So we did play them twice. Once was here in Canberra and once was at home. They managed to get us both them, uh, both. But one was very controversial with the uh, Dave Fafita one. Or have when I looked at that, the website, have I, uh, maybe I've gotten one from the previous year. Yeah, I'm pretty certain the one from the previous year because we played the, the 26-22 Dave Fafita no try down there in Canberra, which is a part of that Dolphins and Eels fiasco. Uh, but no, I'm looking at the draw here. We didn't, we didn't play them at home last year. That's what I was just checking as well. Um, we will cut this part out if you don't mind, and I'll restart this segment. <laughs> no, 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 Mr. Dane. No, we'll, we'll keep it there. It's okay, bro. Like People understand that we can, we can make mistakes, and at the end of the day, we still did lose 100% of our games against them last year, so it's not two games. It's one game, but I, I'm pretty certain the, the season before in 2022 uh, obviously was the comeback down there in Canberra as well, and we did get beaten by them at home as well. So we haven't won against them in a few games. Yep, my apologies there to our viewers. So we did only verse them once last year. That previous game I referenced was the year before, which unfortunately we did lose. Uh, but the game last year, everyone will remember here in Canberra, it was controversial. Like Dave Fafita was disallowed a try um, as apparently he pushed Fogarty in the back and then uh, Alofiana Campero knocked the ball in, on in goal, which would constitute a 20-metre restart and seven tackles set. I believe it was Matt Tomoko scoops it up and runs 100 metres to score. Bunker doesn't pick it up. 
Raiders are in form, mate. They they did have two losses uh, this year. They have had two losses rather, but they are coming off of the huge 35-point win over the Eels. So with that in mind, how do you see this one playing out for us in the nation's capital? Uh, yeah, so we haven't beaten them since that game you referenced before in 2021. Uh, that was the last time we did beat them uh, in general uh, because we did have... We're not going to go into the recent games, but we did have a... Well, actually, I think that was our first collapse. I think our first collapse in that little period might have been... Oh, 2022, maybe? I don't know, early 2022 or in 2021 as well. I can't remember. Um, it happened one week before, mate, because I remember I was actually sitting next to you and we were saying at halftime, don't get too comfortable. We did this last right, week. Yeah. Yeah, it might have been like Manly Rabbitohs week before, I can't remember. But at the end of the day, uh, or maybe the Broncos, geez, the fact that we can name four different teams and it's not just one instance with either of the, with all of them is concerning. Uh, well, was mm-hmm. concerning anyway. Uh, but yeah. yeah, look, the Raiders coming into this game, uh, they beat the Knights 28-12, which was a massive upset. So the Raiders were predicted to be bottom four for people who aren't really too in line with the whole NRL. The Raiders were predicted to be potential last place and to be potentially, they lost Jackie Whiten, who went to the Rabbitohs this offseason. He went to win a premiership he said how's that going for the um but yeah the Raiders you know they lost him they went in as massive underdogs in Newcastle 128-12 gave the the West Tigers a good uh, little little touch up there at GIO Stadium 32-12 and then went to over to New Zealand which is not easy lost 18-10 there lost to the Sharkies 36-22 the week after that which was a massive comeback from the Sharks too because it was 18-0 to the Raiders uh, in the first 20 minutes but the Sharks just absolutely whooped them home and then took on the Eels and beat them 41-8 to but with that being said, the Raiders did take on an Eels team that with, without Mitchell Moses, they've got you know a rookie in the halves. Dylan Brown's not a halfback. You know, this Eels team was all over the shop. They're going through a little bit of a... Kind of, they're in the bottom four too, right now, the Parramatta Eels. So, you know, the Raiders are doing well. They are in form. They did beat the Eels by a big margin. People are forgetting pretty quickly about those Warriors and Sharkies losses there. And Ricky Stewart absolutely roasted them after that Sharks loss. So... There's a reason why we're $3.21 underdogs and not $6 underdogs in regards to this Cam Raiders game, uh, especially with the fact that I think that the bookies are still just that... I feel like there's still like a Des Hasler effect right now where people are a little bit... They have the thought process that things will click or things can click, and it's like, when will it click? And I feel like if you look at odds a lot, guys, you'd normally see a team that is 0-5 right now, 0-4 right now, whatever... Uh, coming into a game against a Raiders team at home, gritty team uh, who are in form, as I say, you know, at the end of the day, usually you'd see a team come in like six to one underdogs, but we're not. We're three twenty one, so they're still giving us a slight little opportunity here. Um, and I think that also comes down to the fact that people don't really believe in Canberra too much just yet. But look, it's it's an exci- it's an exciting game for us off the back of a improved Cowboys performance, and it's exciting to think that the players now understand that we are at the crux of this Desi Hasler experiment in regards to this first five rounds. So you have to perform in this game. There is no ifs, there's no buts, there's no maybes. We're going to be in Canberra and you have to perform. And as the Sharkies show, they can be beaten and beat well. As the Warriors showed, the Raiders, who are a gritty and grindy team, can be out grittied and can be out grindied, right? Which is not words, but they're words right now. So what I say is that this Titans team, if they have the right mindset, this could be our first one of the season. Now, I know there's going to be groans everywhere and moans. Oh, here we go. Blaze is just talking. You know, he's just being positive for the sake of he just wants to see them win. He's just biased. And it's like, you know what? Feel free to think that, right? Feel free. Because don't worry, we get this regardless. Win, lose, or draw, or whatever we predict here, myself and Clarkie, we will cop it for what we say that could be positive because people just want to be down in the dumps with this team. And they may not be wrong in regards to how they feel. You're entitled to how you feel. But at the end of the day, I will look for the positives and I will go into a game thinking, this is when we click. This is when we do it. And we have a big away trip to New, um, New Zealand in a couple of weeks. We have Manly, uh, Desi Hasler's old... Uh, old team there that we play at home next week and I think that this needs to be the game if, if there's going to be a game that can help us click and get us right I genuinely do go into this one thinking it more than Manly and definitely more than New Zealand in Auckland uh, even though the last time we played New Zealand on Anzac Day in Auckland we did beat them in 2017 I think it was so uh, but that's getting a little bit ahead of ourselves I go into this game with a thought process that I saw positives I can see it start to click and this is a do or die for a lot of these players I can see us winning this game. 
Yeah, I don't quite have that same confidence, but I'm also not going to rule out a win completely. Just like the Cowboys one, where we shown positives and we were in it at a stage and we could have gone on to win. I'm probably holding this game in the same regard, where I'm not prepared to say we'll win, but I don't want to absolutely write it off. Here's my concern. This year, the Raiders have improved their attack. Last year, their attack wasn't that flash hot, but they defended really well. This year, they're averaging 27 points per game, and we've conceded 28 or more points in our last nine straight NRL games. That is an all-time NRL record. It's not a pretty one to have. Mm -hmm. Uh, It sucks we have that, actually. Um, In their three games this year, their average win margin has been by 24 points. So I just look at that, and I think if you compare those stats, it's probably a game for us where we look for improvements and we look for positives to take away from it like last week rather than an outright win. So an outright win would just be that much better because of that fact. Can I quickly jump in here for a second? Please do. So you spoke about, what was the the average winning margin again? So they have scored 24 points in their wins this year on average. Mm. Oh, oh, they scored 24 points. Okay. But with that being said, they have taken on the Knights, the Tigers, and the bottom four Eels. Now, and and the Knights who are also near enough to the bottom four, Tigers aren't obviously in the eight. Now, I will clarify here by saying to everyone who's moaning right now, I know that we are as bad as we have been. I'm very aware of that, but I am trying to put into perspective that the Raiders have not actually beaten anyone of significant note just yet. And the two teams that are probably significant enough to note, they did lose to. So you go on with what you're saying. No, that's absolutely fair to interject there. It's a great point. But I kind of look at like last week, mate. Like So last week, Chad Townsend gets sin-binned, and that's an opportunity for us to throw the ball around and, and improve our attack. And we took that opportunity. It's not our fault Chad Townsend did a hip drop. You know, I don't know why absolutely. other fans were angry at us, but, you know, we took the opportunity. It was awesome. This week, I want to see our defense as the improver. And the challenge for us is actually pretty easy. Keep them under 28 points because that is our current standard based on our last NRL nine games. You know, other teams' standard is like we want to keep them under three tries today. Ours is up there at 28 points, guys. We've just got to keep them under 28 points, and that is an improvement because in our last nine games, we've conceded that amount or more, and that's a really poor stat. Giro Stadium hasn't been our best ground to play at. Our last win came three years ago, and overall we are five from 14 at the venue. But when I but, look to a... But yep. I do remember a nice little field goal back in the day at Canberra, and I will never forget that one. I actually thought that was going to be the one that you referenced when you did the uh, blast in the past today. I thought you were going to bring up now, the one from... Uh, I think it was Greg Bird, maybe, back in 20... Uh, it was a long time ago. You go on what you're saying. I'm going to go find that game. You go on what you're saying. Oh, that 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 would be uh, an awesome memory to bring back there. But for me, I think it's about containing their outside backs. Now, they were really dangerous last round against the Eels. The Eels did lack a little bit of pace out wide in Mike Acebo, who was found out, whereas we do have that pace with Harley um, there on that edge. But they are averaging more than 100 post-contact metres per game than us. And without Tino, I do fear they can win that middle battle and win it quite well. That would bring their outside backs into it and make it make them equally as dangerous as they were against the Eels. So really, my key to victory could be containing their middle just as much. But if I can only name one, my key to victory is containing their outside backs and defending well, which I believe we can do because AJ Brimson shown us that potential when he shut down um, Valentine Holmes last week early in that first half. What game and round did that one end up being? Oh, I found it, son. 2011, 2011, which was actually... Fun fact for everybody, the year that we, we won the wooden spoon. But uh, this was, yeah, 23-22 down there in Canberra. Uh, Greg Bird kicks the field goal uh, to win the game there in round four. So close enough. Hey, listen, it might be starting to kind of, uh, you know, show us a little bit of something, something. We want to keep him on a 28. Well, guess what? We kept him on a 28 there. Hey, listen, this was around, what, what are we, round six now? It's round four. Close enough. Still picking part of the season. We actually end up winning one spin that year, so maybe not that one, right? But um, at the end of the day, yeah, we, we did have that one back there, which uh, that's that's what I originally thought you were going to have as your blast in the past. But with that being no. said, the one you, you brought up was still great. Um, and did you say something else? Well, if we do versus the Raiders again this year twice, like I thought we did last year, then I think you've revealed what your blast from the past will be. I don't in think that we game. do play them again. I don't think we play them again. We okay. never seem to play Canberra at home. Um, we don't usually play... We played them a couple of years ago at home. I think 2022, maybe. But besides that, I don't... Yeah, we don't play them again this year. So... Okay. Um, well, you've revealed your 2025 hand. I've revealed my hand, son. <laughs> I have revealed my hand. Mate, if you could name one key to victory or maybe one thing you really want to see this week, what would it be? 
I think what I want to see this week is these boys know that this is do or die. Like this is this. I know it's only round six, but at the end of the day, it's it's do or die here for these boys uh, in regards to you know keeping this playing group together. Uh, I think I need to see a lot out of the forwards because you're going up against a big Raiders forward pack. But with that being said. They have lost Corey Horsburgh, which is a big loss. Now, Zach Hosking will come in, which does help them, and he's been on form. Uh, but they also do lose Jordan Rapana, who is a big part of their back line. Uh, and Chevy Stewart uh, will be coming into their, their back line uh, for the Raiders. So, a couple of outs here uh, for, for the Raiders. You know, good in there with Zach Hosking. But they've just got a really tough forward pack, right? Josh Papaletti. Dane Levi has been on massive form this year. Joseph Tarpany, Hudson Young, Zach Hosking, Morgan Smithies. And if you don't know, Morgan Smithies is an absolute tackle bot machine from over there in England, right? So, uh, and then you go to the bench. They've got Pasami Saulo, Trey Mooney, Adam Mariota, and, and Tom Starling, which is a solid bench. So it just comes down to Moeki Fodawaka, Chrissy Randall, Jimmy Jolliffe, Dave Fafida, Bo Firma, Khalees Haas killing it once again, uh, and then comes down to our bench being able to match them with the likes of Isaac Liu, with the likes of Aaron Clark, and Josiah Pahulu coming on, and Sam Bells and Tom Starling. We've got the, the double hooker battle between Daniel Levi and, and Tommy Starling versus Chrissy Randall and Sammy Verrills. Uh, I still personally believe, again, Sam Verrill should be the starting nine, uh, and that's not at the detriment of Chris Randall, who's been quality. I just think that he is better used in other positions elsewhere across the game rather than just sticking him there in that hooker position. But again, round five, five rounds in, five weeks in for this team. We'll see what Desi will adjust based off of these first early rounds after this week. Uh, and yeah, the key to victory is to simply beat them in the forwards, which is not an easy thing to do against Canberra in Canberra, but it just has to be done. Two final preview points from myself. You mentioned Danny Levi. He's got the second most try involvements of any hooker this year. So yes, we three. Yeah. So we do need we do need to be uh, aware, and we do need to match that semi barrel. So please come off the bench and bring that spark for us. And uh, Chevy Stewart. I think that's someone that Tanner can look to target with his fifth tackle options mm. um, and really test him one day, but when make him have a nervous moment early with a big bomb and kick pressure. And I'm going to say as well in regards to Sammy Verrills, he probably had his best game for the club against the Cowboys as well. He actually set up a quite a few good tries in those second half. Yeah. Um, and I think that he is making that play. Like we, we have been critical of him. And I will put my hand up and say, we absolutely have been, that he hasn't necessarily come in and done what he's needed to do, maybe based on that injury. But at the end of the day, he hasn't lived up to the expectations so far. That doesn't mean that he can't live up to the expectations. And if he plays like he did against the Cowboys when he came on, I'm telling you, things are starting to click. We're starting to potentially see the right movements. Now, I hope that I'm not going to be absolutely ambushed in this game. Like, obviously, you know, I, I go in with, the lowest of expectations, but the highest of hopes, right? So I'm very realistic that this game, we could get whooped, right? And I want everyone to understand, and you obviously do, that there is a chance we are not happy by the end of this weekend because of the way the Raiders are playing. But I will also reiterate and stand by it and say that there is a genuine chance that we could click this weekend. The positives that we saw last weekend against the Cowboys weren't just a one-off, and it is time to potentially start seeing this team improve. So I'm going with a positive mindset. I'm very realistic about what can happen, but give us your tip. Give us your tip, then I'll give mine. Final prediction for me is I believe the Raiders will win this game, but I do think we have an opportunity to show improvements in our defense. Mm. We're coming up against a powerful forward pack, so we have an opportunity to build our momentum and really prove to ourselves that even without Tino, we can contain some of these best forward packs. And I also think they've got outside backs that are traveling really well. So there's a challenge there. There's a challenge and an opportunity here for us to rise to the occasion and meet that challenge. And if we do, and if we do get the win, it's going to be so much special, more special for us fans, whether we're there live or watching. Mm. But I do believe the Raiders have the capability to beat us in this one. What's your final prediction? Yeah, look, we both tipped the Cowboys last week uh, and we're both right, unfortunately. Uh, you know, we obviously do try to create as realistic... Well, we definitely are going down a path of being a lot more realistic rather than just tipping us every week. Uh, but I'm actually going to tip us this week. Uh, yeah, I'm nice. going to do it. I'm going to back us in. I'm going to back us in. If we lose this game, I do have concerns about Manly and I do have concerns about New Zealand and I probably won't tip us in either of those two games, to be completely honest with you. Uh, but I think this is... 
as I've mentioned already in this podcast, the last chance season. Like This is the last chance for this playing group. They need to get it done now. Otherwise, there will be changes that Desi does. Now, I don't know if that means mass changes. I don't think that we have the capabilities uh, to, to do mass changes. But at the end of the day, there will be changes made, is what I would be assuming based off of how the club has dictated it before the season, during the season. Desi said, five, give us five games. This will be our fifth game. So I'm expecting that after these five games, things will start to be adjusted based off what Desi sees. Now, does Desi go in and say, if we lose this game, I would probably expect some changes for sure. I definitely would expect some changes, to be fair. Uh, but if we go and win this game, I would not be surprised if it's only minute, miniature touches. I would not be surprised if it's only miniature touches and you still see people complaining significantly next week, regardless of a win. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think that if our forwards match their forwards, we actually do have, on paper, a better back line than them. On paper. That's not me saying that they're going to go and beat them on, uh, beat them on paper, because we all know that on paper doesn't really mean jack. But at the end of the day, I'm taking JC over Chevy Stewart. Wingers of Harley Smith Shields, Jojo and Fida against James Schiller and Xavier Savage. I think people are going to jump on the form of Schiller and Xavier Savage, but I don't think it's a great... Also, Smith Shields going up against his, older t- his ex-team here. I don't think it's a massive difference between Jojo and Harley. I will give the, the informed Schiller and Savage and say that they're probably you know there. But at the end of the day, I don't think it's a crazy difference. I think the centre battle of Muddy Tomoko and Sebastian Chris versus Brian Kelly and AJ Brimson, I think on paper, on paper, you take the two Titans guys. But I think that on form, obviously you're taking Tomoko and Sebastian Chris. And then in regards to the halves, on paper, you've got Kieran Four and Jamal Fogarty, two experienced guys, and then Tanner Boyd, who's played for, for a few years now, Ethan Strange coming in, he's got the form. But I don't think that that's a dramatic difference as well. So I think that, again, if it comes down to this game, if we're going to win this game, we have to win by the forwards. If our forwards don't win the middle, we're not winning this game. Simple as that. But I'm taking Titans 1-12. to I will not take us convincingly. But I will say that I believe this is a game that can be won. And if I believe a game can be won, I will take our boys. That was quite possibly the longest final prediction you've ever given, and you must not want to eat because you've got four minutes until you're live on YouTube for an hour and a half, my friend. Uh, but I certainly hope your prediction is right. Uh, but can you can you hear that? What am I hearing? Hello? Oh, no. Yeah, this is Clarky, co-host of the Gold Coast Titans Frontline Podcast. Oh, no. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course I'll remind everyone that this is where the phone, the frontline segment will be in future weeks. No one was calling then. I've made a You've sound from this, YouTube. Adam. So... Adam, this is your fault. This is, <laughs> this is your fault, Adam. <laughs> yes, I'm an absolute loser that called myself to say that. But if you do want to get involved in phone, the frontline, this is where we will react to all of your takes. Speakpipe.com forward slash frontline podcast. Go on, leave a recording. And at Feel this the point of the podcast in future weeks, we will respond to it. But for now, we are going to close the show, guys. That is all we have time for. But before we do, I actually want to say thank you so much. Like, if you're here listening to us right now, we do not take your viewership lightly, uh, lightly, especially during this difficult period of the club. Like, it'd be so easy for you guys right now to just not care about Titans because we haven't started the year like we all thought. So the fact you are here right now, please know from both of us, you are genuinely appreciated We absolutely love the fact that you are still on board with the Titans and as passionate as we are. And it it just shows your true colours and how much the club needs people like you, the fact you're listening to us right now. So we really, really appreciate it. Before we go, Blaze. The Raiders have an oldest... Okay, you go first. No, you know what? Say it, say it, say it. I'm just actually quickly going to say, I was not smiling at him thanking you just then, guys. I was not smiling at... Go on, Clarky. No, we're, we're very sincere in that. But what we aren't sincere is how we finish these podcasts. It's always a joke at the end. The Raiders, and I wrote this joke myself, by the way, guys, so please no, feel no. free to rate it. The Raiders are an older side full of veteran players. Where will we put them on Sunday, Blaze? I'm not responding to you. The Norsing home. <laughs> no, I joke, but it is time for our season to be beyond again. There's... Norway, I just said those puns. Go, you mighty Titans. Come on, boys. Let's flog these Raiders here in Canberra. I love you. Thanks for being here, Blaze. Say farewell to the show. 
my apologies uh, to everybody who listens. Uh, he thanked you. He thanked you for listening. Uh, I apologise that you have to listen uh, to Clarky's puns every single week. Uh, and <laughs> this is why we love him. This is why we love him. But also, I can understand if you've already clicked off the podcast by now. Uh, but hit that thumbs up button. Subscribe here on YouTube. Follow us on Spotify, Apple. Give us a rating. Uh, and as Clarky was saying, the description. The description is where you go for the link to be able to send in a voice message for next week. Uh, do we slap the Raiders, baby? I messed up. I messed up their uh, their Viking club last year, and I'm doing it again, son. Doing it ah, again. Mate, I tell you what, if you again. if you want to get the clap, Canberra's the place to go for it. So <laughs> I'm not going to confirm or deny that.